system from that special this morning, face to face. One day we'll see the Lord. And uh, the hymn writer also said it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. We're glad you're here on this wintry, springy day. It's the Lord's day, and, and he made it every... I pre-record our radio program, Timeless Church Radio Ministry, and uh, when I pre-recorded it, it was probably Tuesday of last week. I had mentioned on the radio that uh, it was a beautiful day outside. Well, of course, I'm not prophetic, but I was thinking spring has sprung, and it would be a good day, a nice day, and it's the day the Lord has made. And, and of course, it was snowing this morning, and I got an email from someone who listened to the program and said, it's not a very nice day out there. <laughs> I hope they got something from the Bible, uh, but uh, we're glad you're here, and uh, we thank the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, and uh, we're thankful for His creation. And you know, the snow reminds us that our sin is gone, it's washed whiter than snow. It's a wonderful reminder to us. Uh, Romans chapter 6 is where we are in our Bibles. Romans chapter 6, we'll begin our reading this morning in verse number 17. Romans chapter 6, we'll begin our reading in verse number 17. We are continuing our series, I Am Not Ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. We're walking together through the book of Romans, and we've come to the end of the sixth chapter. We'll begin our reading in verse 17, Romans chapter 6. The Bible says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness." For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray together. Father, help us, I pray, as we look at this passage of Scripture together. And Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would guide us into all truth. This is, this is your word. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, it knows our actions. It knows our motives. And I pray, Father in heaven, that we would allow the Bible to be our teacher. I pray, Father in heaven, that we would yield to the Holy Spirit this morning. I pray that you would bind Satan and his demons. I pray that your word would fall on good ground this morning. I pray that you would bless every good decision. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our series, again, is entitled, I Am Not Ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. Uh, there were those who claimed in the book of Romans that the Apostle Paul was ashamed of the message of the gospel because he did not come to Rome to preach it. And uh, Paul made it very clear through the first chapter that he was separated unto the gospel and that he wanted to go to Rome and preach the gospel, but he was delayed. He was um, detoured because of the, the devil and because he was not able to come. In verse 16, he makes this bold statement, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And it would be the message of the gospel that eventually the Apostle Paul would die for. He was courageous in his declaration. He was composed in his desires. And he was compliant to his directive to preach the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. We began in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, and we looked at universal condemnation, that all the world is guilty before God. For all have sinned, Romans 3, 23, and have come short of the glory of God. Paul continues with a defense, a defense against the Judaizers, those who were adding to 
salvation to Jesus Christ. They were saying, well, salvation was by Christ, but also you had to be circumcised as well. And there are those today who will add and take away from the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible teaches us in chapters 4 and 5 that salvation is not by the law, but salvation is by the grace of God. That if it is by the law, then grace is void. In other words, if it is by the law, it is only by the law. Therefore, we would have to work for our eternal life. It is not through Christ at all. We would have to keep the law. But the Bible tells us it is not by works. It is by the Lord Jesus, by grace. Romans 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all seed. And Abraham is given to us as an example. Abraham was justified by faith before his circumcision. He was not saved by his works. He was saved by God's grace. And then we move into chapter uh, 6, and we come to this thought where people are saying, well, if it's by the grace of God, then I can just live any way I want. I can just live the life I want to live. And then the Apostle Paul speaks and preaches of a different dynamic, that when someone comes to Jesus Christ, they are dead to sin. Baptism is given as an illustration. We are baptized by the Spirit of God into a new position. This is upon salvation. We are in Jesus Christ, and therefore we are identified with Christ. We are identified with his death. We are identified with his resurrection. Christ the Lord is risen today, sons of men and angels say. Raise your hands in triumphs high, sing ye heavens, and earth reply. When Jesus rose from the grave, we also rose, and the Bible says that we are to walk in newness of life. And then in verse 23 of the book of Romans, the sixth chapter, we have a contrast of two different families. We have the family of God. He is our heavenly Father to those who know the Lord. Matthew 6, verse 26. But then there is Satan, and the Bible says that he is the father of lies. John chapter 8, verse 44. The Bible tells us this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we're looking at a contrast this morning. We're looking about, about what the Bible says about the family of God, those who come to Jesus Christ, and their destination and those who remain in the family of, of Lucifer, Satan, the devil, the father of lies, and their destination as well. So let's look at, first of all, number one in your notes, let's notice the doctrine of God. The doctrine of God. Verse 17 is where we'll find this point. The Bible says, verse 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you. We see, first of all, in our passage of Scripture, the past life. The past life. The Bible says that they, notice this in the past tense, they were the servants of sin. Now this is talking about an individual who has come to Jesus Christ. They have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Their past life was that they were a part of the devil's family. They were, the Bible says, the servants of sin. They walked according to their lusts and their desires, and they could not please God. The Bible tells us in Matthew 7 that their pathway or their course was on the way, on their way to a devil's hell. There's a narrow way, and there's a and there's a broad way, and many are on the broad road, but there are few on the narrow way. The narrow way leads to life everlasting, and the broad road is the course of sin, and the Bible says it leads to a devil's hell. And so there's the past life that Paul makes very clear. But then we see, be there in your notes, the presented truth, the presented truth. Now, what changed past? This, this is important because they're on their way to a devil's hell. They're on this course, separated from God. The Bible says in Romans 5 that they were the enemies of God. What changed? 
What, what put them on the path of God or put them on the narrow way? Well, the Bible says they obeyed from the heart. We see their acceptance. I want us to move forward, if we could, a couple of chapters and look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Let's just turn a couple of pages ahead and notice what the Bible says. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9. Romans 10 verse 9. The Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth, uh, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now notice the expression that we find in this scripture. The Bible says that we must believe in thine heart. Verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The heart speaks of the core of an individual. Now, we're talking about more than just the external. We're talking about more than just tagging on a title in our life. You know, we think about in our day and age, the word Christian or the title Christian. You know, people who don't even know what the Bible says just because they believe that Canada is a Christian nation. They'll say, well, I'm a Christian. But this is not salvation. The Bible teaches us that they accepted a message from their heart. This speaks of the core of an individual. They believed with their heart, and they trusted with their heart, and they had faith in God and this message. And so we find their acceptance. But what did they believe? What was the message that was given to them? Notice not only their acceptance, but also the addressing that we find in this passage of Scripture. The Bible says that they obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. If you're in a habit of marking in your Bible, would you underline that expression, that form of doctrine which was delivered you? What was this form of doctrine? This was the gospel. This is the message that Paul was not ashamed of. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the death it is the burial. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The hope that we have, Jesus is alive. We are alive in Jesus, and we have eternal life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's turn there. I want you to see this passage. I, uh, this is a great text about the gospel, and you can use this when you talk to individuals. This form of doctrine, the gospel... They received this message with their heart, the message that was delivered unto them. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. By the way, any time the Apostle Paul entered into a city, he always preached the gospel. He always gave them the good news of God, that Jesus died and that Jesus lives again, and that if they believe from their heart this message, that they could have eternal life. The Bible says in verse number 3, For I delivered unto you first of all, this was the message that he preached unto them. He gave to them first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This is this form of doctrine. But it goes further than just the gospel message. But Paul uses the expression, this form of doctrine, because he's talking about this message was healthy doctrine. It was what the Bible calls sound doctrine. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ can save a man from their sin. It is according to the Word of God that Jesus died and was buried and that He rose again. It is sound doctrine. And by the way, there are a lot of churches this morning that have gathered together and they are not preaching from the Bible. They are not preaching sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? I gave you a definition in your notes this morning. Sound means whole. It means unbroken. It means unharmed. It means free from flaw 
or from defect or from decay. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, Paul said, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. You see, they found deliverance from their sin by obeying from their heart what God told them to do. This is the message. God's pathway to heaven today is to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of God, that man can be saved as they call upon the Lord Jesus. And then the Bible says that those that call upon the Lord shall not be confounded. They will never be disappointed as they put their trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. We see letter C there in your notes. There is the position child. So get the picture. They were dead in their sins. They were on their way to hell. They were lost and they were dying in their sin. And then they obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for you. Jesus lives again and you can have victory in Jesus. And they believed the gospel of Jesus. They called upon the Lord. And the Bible says that they were positioned into the family of God. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. They were once lost. They were once undone. They were once dead in their sin. They were on their way to hell, but now they are free from sin. They are free from the penalty, or the Bible says here, the wage of sin. They are free from the dominion of sin. They are free from those chains that bind them and hold them down. Now they are not the servants to sin, but they are the servants to God, to live and to please God. That is, by the way, the born-again believer's desire is to please the Lord and to serve the Lord. And so we have this position child. There's now new life in Jesus Christ. This is the doctrine of God. This is the gospel that changes individuals' life, uh, lives, the doctrine of God. But then we see number two in your notes. There is the dedication to righteousness. The dedication to righteousness. Look what the Bible says in verse 19. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness to, uh, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. And what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Knows that expression this morning. For the end of those things is death. We see, first of all, an illustration. An illustration. In verse, uh, in, in verse number 19, he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. This, it, it, what he's saying in this passage is, I, I, I give to you an illustration. I say after a manner that is common to everyday life. This is something that you will understand. Now, he's trying to describe to us what happened when we trusted Christ as our Savior. This new life in Jesus. What, what took place in an individual's heart. And so he gives us an illustration. He speaks here of an infirmity. Letter B in your notes, verse 19. He says, I give to you an illustration from common life because of this infirmity of your flesh. Now the word infirmity in our Bible, it means weakness. It speaks of feebleness. It, it, it talks about that which the opposite would be strength. So it talks about that weakness that was found in this individual. The word flesh is used often in our Bible to denote corruptness and the passions of man. And you can put that together, the corrupt passions of, of man. But I believe in the scripture from the context, he's talking about the weakness in their intellect. He's talking about the weakness of their understanding. He's saying in this passage, I give to you an illustration because you're not understanding this. 
I give to you an illustration that is common in the life that you live so that it will help you to understand what happened to you when you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So what illustration that he that uh, that uh, what illustration does he give us? Well, the illustration is a master and a slave. And by the way, this was very uh, something that they would totally understand during in the in the Roman Empire. There were millions of slaves at this particular time, and so they would understand this. And so here is the illustration that that the Apostle Paul gives. And so number one, we see before Christ, sin was the master. Before Christ, sin was the master. Before someone comes to the Lord Jesus, the master of their life is sin. Verse 19, he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity, unto iniquity. The word uncleanness here refers to impurity of life in any form, to degraded passions that were common among the, the the heathens. And the thought here, iniquity unto iniquity, speaks of the downward direction of sin and where sin leads an individual. They had followed their desires. They had followed their passions. They had followed their own wicked heart. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so the Bible tells us, Paul writing is saying that they followed that wicked heart. They followed those desires. And one iniquity, one sin led to another sin. And we find the downward uh, spiral that occurred in their, in their life. You know, I believe in the scripture we could say that Paul is reminding these believers where they came from, what they were saved from. He's reminding them that they were on the course to hell, but now they're on the pathway to God. I believe it's important to be reminded of our former lives, to be awakened to repentance, to excite gratitude, to produce humility and a firmer purpose in our life to live for God, to remember where we came from, but by the grace of God, we are saved and we are on a pathway and we can know God. We are on the pathway to heaven. You know, my friend, don't, don't live in the past, but you can learn from the past. Thank God that he saved us. Thank God that he washed those sins away. What did this produce? What did this sin produce? It produced a sinful life. In fact, here in this passage of Scripture, Paul said that this life, this iniquity after iniquity, this life it produced, he said, you're ashamed to talk about it. You don't even want to mention it. This is the life that you live. This is the direction that you that you had in your life. And he says, you're, you're ashamed to even mention this is who you are. This is what you did. But thank God he saved us. Thank God he changed our desire. Thank God he changed our direction in our life. And so we find that before salvation, that sin was our master. And we were the slave to sin is the illustration. But after salvation, our master is God. Our master is gone. Verse 22 helps us to understand that. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. God is now our master. By the way, I want to say this. Before salvation, we were the enemies of God. After salvation, we're the child of God. Before salvation, we were dead in our sin. And now after salvation, we are dead to sin. There is a great contrast, a great contrast in the life of an individual who truly knows Jesus as their Savior. God is now our master. And the fruit of salvation, the fruit of eternal life, the Bible says, is unto holiness. Think about that contrast. Iniquity unto iniquity. We just live to please ourselves. We live to, to, to please our desires. But now something changed in our life. Because sin is no longer our master. You say, Pastor, after I got saved, do we still sin? Absolutely. But hey, our look at sin and, and our desire is not to sin and fulfill those desires. But our desire now is to please God and to live for God. 
the Bible says our direction has changed. Now we are living unto holiness. It is truly a life that pleases the Lord. There is dedication to Christ. There is dedication and desire to please Christ with our life. And so there's the doctrine of God. It is eternal life. It is sound doctrine, the gospel. Jesus Christ and Jesus alone has saved their soul. They believed on the Lord Jesus with their heart, the core of their being. They trusted him, and now they had eternal life. And there was a dedication to righteousness. They desired to please God. They desired to live for God. Where sin was their old master, now God is their master. They are the servants to the Lord. But I want to give to you this third thought, and I'll be done this morning. And that is a destination declared. We come to the very last verse. This is a popular verse. If you're familiar with the Romans road and you've ever led anyone to the Lord Jesus Christ, you would be very familiar with this scripture. In verse 23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The context of this passage of scripture is to define the fruit of each direction. Now remember this. Every direction in life has a destination. And every direction is, is brought about by the decisions that we make. And there is no greater decision than accepting or rejecting the Lord Jesus. Accepting the Lord is coming to Christ. And even in man's inactivity is really rejecting the Lord. And so the contrast is clearly declared in the fruit that each direction produces. And there are two directions. There is the wage of sin, and there's the life found in God. So really we could say that God is, is putting in front of us a decision. He's saying there is life, and there is death, and you must make a choice. It reminds me of what's found in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's turn back there, if we could. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. God gave this choice to Israel as well. It is listed in the 15th verse, Deuteronomy chapter 30 and the 15th verse. Israel had a choice to make, and my friend today, we all have a choice to make. Verse 15, it says, See, I have said before thee this day, life and good and death and evil. And that I commanded thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, thou shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. There is a choice to be made. God said, I have put before you life and good and death and evil. And by the way, this abiding battle has been upon humanity since the fall in the Garden of Eden. Will we follow God or will we follow ourselves? Because really, there are only two decisions on the shelf. You'll please God or you'll please self. And this is the decision. It is life and good or death and evil. Life and good, death and, or evil. The choice must be made. The choice must be made. Our world today is constantly fighting against God. Fighting against God. Our world today is constantly fighting against God's plan for humanity, God's plan for eternal life. Will man follow God's defined word on marriage? Will God define, uh, follow God's defined roles in life? Will, God, uh, will man follow God's ways in salvation? Or will they choose their own way? Will they follow their own way? There is a choice to be made. Life and good or death and evil. And God declares through his word over and over again, he says, choose life. Choose life. Choose the Lord. Don't choose death. Don't choose separation. True, choose life. Choose Jesus. The word in our Bible, wages. 
It properly denotes what is purchased to be eaten with bread as fish, flesh, and vegetables. And thence it means the pay of the Roman soldier, because formerly it was a custom to pay the soldier for such supplies. And so the word came in to be used as wages. In other words, it means that, that which a man earns or deserves, that which is his proper pay, that which it merits. In other words, if you live in sin, if you walk in sin, then you're going to reap what you sow. If you choose Jesus Christ, you will reap what you sow. A choice is to be made. That's what the Bible is saying. And the Bible tells us in this passage that the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 8 says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. We reap what we sow. So what is the contrast of this passage of Scripture? What is the destination for each of these choices? Well, we see first of all, A in your notes, the destination of sin. May I say to you today that sin is a horrible master? A horrible master? It uses you? And it abuses you. It fascinates. And then it assassinates. It thrills. And then it kills. Sin is a horrible master. And how many lives have been destroyed by the master of sin? How many wasted opportunities by the master of sin? The flesh desires that which is displeasing to God. And Satan delightfully feeds it those things because he does not want us to be near the Lord. The Bible says what is sin's destination? It is death. It is death. James 1.14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived... It bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. There are so many people that believe that they're going to be the exception of the rule. But my friend, today you cannot cheat death. The Bible tells us because of sin, the consequence of death is upon all men, for all have sinned. And those who do not know Jesus as their Savior... The Bible says that after death will come the judgment and there they'll be separated from God who loves them and died for them for all eternity. That's what the Bible says. The destination of sin is death. But I want to give to you, be there in your notes, the destination of grace. I called it grace because it speaks of the gift of God. And the gift of God is by the grace of God. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. But, here's the choice, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In fact, in verse 22, the verse before, it says, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You see, sin equals death. But Jesus Christ equals life. It is the gift that is given by grace. And all they that accept the gift of God will have eternal life. I don't know where you are today. I don't know your standing with God. But God wants to bring you to where you need to be. God wants you to know his son, Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You have a choice to make. It is life and good or death and evil. And my friend, it all comes down to this. What will you do with Jesus Christ? Maybe this morning you've strayed from the Lord, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Maybe you've You've wandered from God. Would you rededicate yourself to the Lord this morning? Would you rededicate your life to Him? Would you make Jesus the King of your life again? Would you let Him 
set on the throne of your life, to make your decisions and dictate your direction. God help us today. God bless every good decision as we think of the contrast of these destinations, life in Jesus or death in sin. The choice is ours. Let's pray together, can we? Father in heaven, I don't know the hearts of the individuals here, but Lord, I believe this, this morning that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, you know where everyone is standing with you. Father, I pray if there's an individual, first of all, that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that maybe they believe they have eternal life, but they're not sure. Maybe they're doubting that this morning. Wherever they stand, I pray, Father in heaven, that you would, the Spirit of God would convict them. And I pray, Lord, that they would talk to myself or they would talk to an individual that they know that maybe invited them, that they would settle the matter of eternal life before it is too late. And I pray, Father, for Christians this morning, as your word of God has spoken to our hearts, I pray, Father, if there's a Christian this morning that may be estranged from you, I pray, Father, that you would revive those, those heartstrings again to serve you and to love you and to be on fire for you. Oh, God, we know that, that this is what this world needs. We don't need lukewarm Christians, but Christians that will live for you and Father, I pray that good decisions will be made. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Let's take a moment to talk to the Lord. Let's stand together if we could. The piano's going to play if God has spoken to your heart.